Welcome to Don Edwards San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge. My name is Hope Presley and I'm the Interpretive Specialist with the San Francisco Bay Wildlife Society, our nonprofit friends group that works directly with our refuge complex. Here at Don Edwards, we protect a whole slew of different animal and plant species. The first habitat that we're going to explore today is our salt marsh. As you can see, our salt marsh habitat is low lining. All of the plants are really short and they don't have many leaves. The reason for this is because they rely on salt water that comes from the bay to survive. As we go along on our tour today, we'll explore and compare the different habitats and you'll see how freshwater plants can grow much larger and bigger compared to our saltwater plants. Here in the salt marsh, we have two main plants. The first one is pickleweed. Pickleweed is like a succulent. Um, it uptakes the salt water. And then in order to get rid of the salt, it actually pushes the salt to the tips of the plant. Those tips will turn red and fall off and go back into the marsh. It has these little segments, which allows it to do so. And of course, it does taste a little bit like pickles. It's salty. And then our other main marsh plant is called Alkali Heath. And so this one looks like a little bit of a shrub. It's kind of a dusty green color. In the spring and summer, it has pretty little purple or lavender colored flowers. And this one gets rid of the salt, um, just like we do. So we actually sweat out the salt in our bodies. That's one way we get rid of salt. Um, and this plant does so too. So right now it's a little bit wet out here. It was foggy this morning. So we don't see too many salt crystals. They already um, kind of washed away off the plant. But during the spring and summer, you can really see the salt crystals like caked onto this plant. And it almost gives the marsh like this shimmery sparkle to it. So those are just two of the main plants that we have here in the salt marsh. As you can see out here in the marsh right now, we have lots of waterfowl, such as ducks and geese. It's fall, so they just made their migration down south here, so they can spend the fall, winter, and spring here. They'll spend fall and winter mostly eating, getting to know their mates, and then in the spring, they'll have their chicks here before they go back up north for the summer. We also have lots of other types of birds that use the marsh such as shorebirds. One common species of shorebird that you'll see here in the marsh is our black neck stilts. These black neck stilts have really long legs. They actually have the second largest leg to body ratio of any bird, the first being the flamingo. They also have pink legs, just like the flamingo. And you can see they also have this very classic look to them. Um, they almost look like they're wearing a tuxedo. So they have a white chest, and then a black um, head and wings and body. They use their long skinny beak to probe into the mud and pull out what we call mud creatures. These mud creatures are snails, clams, worms, um, even little bugs that live in the water. Because of their long legs, they can walk out into the marsh, into the water, and feed in deeper depths. We also have some shorebirds that are small. They eat the same things, but they stay more on the edges of the marsh as to decrease competition. One bird that we see a lot here is our Western Sandpiper. So you can see here, this bird, even though this picture is zoomed in, this bird is really small, only a couple of inches long. They have shorter legs. They still have that skinny pointy beak to probe into the mud, but it's shorter. So not only do they stay more on the edges of the marsh, they also only probe into the marsh on that very surface level, whereas our black neck stilts can probe down to deeper depths. Our ducks and geese also feed in the marsh, but they feed in a different way. Some duck species are dabblers, meaning they do that like upside down where their tail sticks out of the water and they go into the marsh and sort of um, dabble at the surface. Then we also have some diving ducks. So they'll actually dive down um, as far as they can go and scoop up mud from the surface. So all of these birds are eating the same things. They're in the same habitat, but they do so in different ways and in different parts of the marsh. So they can all live here together um, in harmony.
the refuge's work that we do here is protect threatened and endangered species. One of our endangered species is actually a mouse. It's called the salt marsh harvest mouse, or salty for short. Salty's really small. He's about the size of your thumb, plus a tail. He's the only mouse in the world that survives on salt water, and he's endemic to the San Francisco Bay Area. So he is only found here. He also um, can swim, probably not for fun, but if a tide came in and he needed to move into the upper zone of the marsh, then he's able to do so. Our mice also only live for approximately nine months. So they have a lot to accomplish within that short time span. They have to grow up, they have to find a mate, successfully have a family, in order to continue their population. The reason that they are endangered is because of habitat loss. So here in the San Francisco Bay, we have lost approximately 85% of our salt marshes that surround the bay. So we can basically estimate that we've probably lost at least 85% of our salt, har salt marsh harvest mice too. Part of what the refuge does is protect this critical habitat that Salty needs to survive. Another endangered species that we have here is called the California Ridgeways Rail. This is a bird. It's about the size of a chicken, and it kind of looks like a chicken. It has a small head and a larger body. It's very elusive, so you probably won't see it out in the marsh. It likes to hide, so it's far away, hidden from predators. Um, it uses all zones of the marsh. So it can use the upper zone, the middle zone, and the lower zone, which is like the closer you get to the bay. It is a shorebird, so it also eats those mud creatures we talked about earlier, clams, um, snails, worms, and their population has also declined because of habitat loss. Now we are at our second habitat here at the refuge. This is our salt pond. It's our only man-made habitat here at the refuge. It's actually a former salt pond. This pond used to be used to make salt. Here in San Francisco Bay, we used to have multiple companies that produced salt from the water that comes from the bay. So what they did is they built these levees surrounding marsh. They flooded the marsh with bay water which killed off all the plants and moved out all the animals. Then they moved the water from pond to pond and in this process the water would evaporate and salt would be left behind. You might have noticed if you've flown in and out of the Bay Area that there are different colored ponds surrounding the Bay. These ponds are different colors. Some of them have this greenish blue tinge so that means they're either really early in the salt production process or maybe they aren't part of it anymore. And then you can see these bright red, orange, pink ponds. These, this is where the salt production is happening. So as the water evaporates, different types of bacteria grow in the water, and that's what changes the color. This plant is in Newark. It's run by a company called Cargill. They have either donated or sold some ponds to the refuge for us to manage. So as you can see behind me, there are islands that have been added into the pond. You can also see there are lots of different birds that are using these islands. Some of them use the islands just to rest on, but some species actually nest on these islands. We have one species of bird called a Caspian tern, and they will use these islands to nest on during the summertime. So as I mentioned before, these salt ponds replaced salt marsh, which is part of the reason why we've lost over 85% of our marshes. Now, once we've learned from this mistake, salt marshes are really important, not only for wildlife, but also for us. They help protect us against flood risks from sea level rise, storms, um, and we saw the consequences of that in the 80s and 90s when we had lots of flood events happening here in Alviso and even down into San Jose. So part of um, what the refuge is doing to help protect wildlife but also help protect our community is they are part of the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. So a lot of these ponds are actually going to be restored and turned back into salt marsh. So that'll help when there's 
um, sea level rise or maybe a storm. Um, and salt marshes act like a sponge. They soak up any excess water. Um, they also obviously provide habitat for wildlife. So we're also hoping that we'll get to increase some of our endangered species population, like our salt marsh harvest mice and our California Ridgeways rail. Part of the restoration process um, includes redoing some of the levees. So the levee that I'm standing on right now was the original levee. This levee was built potentially 80 to 100 years ago. And as you can see, when you look down the levee, it's kind of falling apart. Um, so this levee is actually going to be replaced. It's part of another project that's working in conjunction with the restoration project. It's called the Shoreline Levee Project. So a lot of our levees that separate our communities from the bay are going to be replaced. Um, some of them are even going to be built bigger um, and larger just in case of sea level rise. They'll also have a larger slope on them, which will allow for more salt marsh plants to grow up on either side, um, which also adds to the stability of that levee. So this is a great spot to see that our salt ponds replaced our salt marsh because on one side of the levee, we have our marsh, but then on the other side is our salt pond. So now we are at our third and fourth habitat that we have here at the refuge. Right now, we're at about a mid-tide. This is the slough habitat. But when this habitat is at low tide, the mudflats are revealed. So both of these habitats, we can only see twice a day. Um, and so we see very different animals in this habitat when we're at high tide versus when we're at low tide. Right now, we're at about a mid tide. This is the slough habitat. But when this habitat is at low tide, the mudflats are revealed. So both of these habitats, we can only see twice a day. And so we see very different animals in this habitat when we're at high tide versus when we're at low tide. So right now, we're kind of at a mid tide. Um, the tide can go up a little bit higher than this. Um, we see some of our waterfowl species out here, um, water birds. So we'll see lots of ducks. Um, pelicans will come in here. Um, gull species will come in here. But then at low tide, when all the water is gone, the mud flats are revealed, that's when the food source really pops in. So we have all of those mud creatures, our snails, clams, worms, and then all of our shorebirds come in here and you'll just see them probing into the mud. Um, some of our duck species will also be here because again, they like to eat those mud creatures too. Um, so they'll be here as well. The main plant that we have here in the slough and the mudflats is called tule. And so tule is a very historically significant plant. Um, it was used a lot by the Ohlone Native Americans that occupied the greater San Francisco Bay Area and that still live here today. And they use this plant um, by cutting it at the base. They would let it dry. Usually takes about five to six weeks to dry out. Then they soak it in water so that they can mend it. Um, and they'd make all sorts of things out of tule. Boats, houses, baskets, um, sleeping mats, clothes potentially. 
Um, so this is a really important plant. It's also a freshwater plant, but this slough is connected to the bay. That's why it's tidal. So how does a freshwater plant survive here in the slough? Well, this water is actually brackish, meaning that it's a mix of salt and fresh water. Where it gets the fresh water from is from local creeks. So in Santa Clara County, we have five watersheds, four of which drain into the San Francisco Bay. Where we're at right now, we are in the Coyote Creek watershed. We're actually right on the edge. Just west of here is the Guadalupe watershed. So we get a big influence here from Coyote Creek. This slough is directly connected to Coyote Creek. It also gets fresh water from another source. This slough is really unique because it's connected to the San Jose Santa Clara Regional Wastewater Facility. This wastewater facility cleans almost all of the water in Santa Clara County um, that comes out of your house. So any water from the inside of your house, your bathroom, kitchen, laundry room, all of that water eventually goes to this wastewater treatment plant. The water gets processed and then about 80 to 85 percent of the water, which is almost 85 million gallons each day, gets dumped into this slough and then ultimately into the bay. The other 15 percent is part of a recycled water program. So you might have noticed these purple pipes and signage throughout Santa Clara Valley. And that means that the water being used here is recycled. Now this water is not water that can go back into your house for you to use, um, but it's okay to use for landscaping um, and other purposes. As I mentioned before, <clears throat> this slough is connected to Coyote Creek. Coyote Creek is the largest watershed that we have here in Santa Clara County. It goes all the way down to Gilroy. And not only does water travel through that watershed, but everything that that water brings. So every time that it rains, water from um, our communities travels into storm drains and then eventually makes it either directly into this watershed, such as directly into Coyote Creek, or directly out here into the bay. And those storm drains do not have any filtration system on them. So everything that travels through the storm drain ends up right out here in our watersheds and in our bay, such as soap from washing your car, trash that might be on the road, um, pesticides from agricultural use, or maybe even stuff that you use in your yard could be washed down the storm drain. So what we recommend doing is checking out mywatershedwatch.org to see what you can do to help protect your watersheds from urban runoff pollution. Some other factors that we have here at the refuge that influence our habitats and our wildlife are landfills. From this spot, we can actually see five different landfills that are adjacent to the refuge land. There's one right here behind me and there's also one right along our entrance road. The way that the landfills um, affect our habitats here is during high wind events, um, some of the trash can get blown over and end up here in the habitats. They do have ways that they help mitigate that, but of course it's not perfect and we do end up with some trash here. We also have a big population of gulls down here in the South Bay and gulls are scavengers. 
they love to go to the landfills and pull out not only food but sometimes trash too so if you're out here on the trails you might notice some dead gulls out in the marsh um, or along the trail some other um, influences that we have here at the refuge is sound so along our tour today you might have heard some urban sounds in the background while i was talking we had some planes fly over we also heard some noise from trucks that are at the landfills. And those noises can be really loud. Luckily today, none of them were so loud that I had to stop talking, but sometimes I have to stop talking during a tour because the plane is so loud. And if we think that the plane is loud, then the animals definitely think that that plane is loud. We also have some other noise pollution um, during celebrations, such as 4th of July. We have lots and lots of firework displays around the Bay Area, one of which is locally here um, in Alviso, and that noise is really loud and can disrupt, disrupt the wildlife. Um, so anything that we can do to help lower that noise pollution and trash or urban runoff pollution, um, we hope that we can all do together. As I mentioned at the beginning of our tour, the salt marsh plants that survive on salt water, they're really low lining, they have really small leaves, it's really hard to grow in salt water. But as you can see, these plants behind me that survive on fresh water, they can grow a lot bigger. They have more woody substances to them, they have bigger leaves, because it's a lot easier to grow in fresh water. Our biodiversity up here in the upland is also a lot greater. Not only do we have many more different types of plants that grow up here, but we also have a big variety of wildlife. This is our butterfly garden, um, but we welcome all pollinators here. So we have lots of butterflies, bees, hummingbirds, um, moths. They all come here for, um, to take advantage of all of our flowering plants. We also have um, some great mammals that use the upland. We have squirrels, of course. We have gray foxes, um, which are a native species to the west coast. Um, on the east coast are the red foxes. Um, those are the ones that you might more commonly think of when you think of a fox, um, but our gray foxes are a lot smaller. They're actually the size of a large house cat, and they have this grayish blue tinge to them. Um, they're also the only fox species that can climb trees. So we'll often see them up in the trees here eating berries, um, maybe some bugs. They're omnivores, so they can eat a big variety of food. Um, and they also roam in packs. So we know that we have at least two packs here um, at the refuge in Alviso, um, but we have lots and lots of animal packs uh, or <laughs> gray fox packs. Um, throughout the South Bay. We also have some of our common mammals like skunks, possums, and raccoons. Some bird species that we have up here are our classic songbirds. Um, we also have a lot of birds of prey. So we have some red-tailed hawks that live up here. We have some white-tailed kites. Um, and then of course our turkey vultures are always um, flying around up here too. Um, this is also the habitat where we do a lot of our restoration work. So we have lots of invasive species of plants that grow up here, and we have to remove those invasives and plant natives because those invasives will take over and actually suffocate the native plants that are meant to grow here. These native plants are critical for our wildlife species, and even more specifically, our pollinator species. Many pollinators rely on a very specific type of plant for either their entire life cycle or maybe even a specific part of their life cycle. So we want to make sure that we're providing the wildlife here with the plants 
and the healthiest habitat um, that they need. A lot of the work that is done um, up here is done by volunteers. So we have a great volunteer program um, and they come and they will remove invasive species and plant the native plants here. Um, and then we even have some school groups that also come and help out with that too. Thank you for joining me on this tour of Don Edwards San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge. You can come out and explore the refuge yourself as our trails are open from sunrise to sunset.